It is noon, so we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone to the fifth sustainability leadership presentation series of 2019-2020. We are glad you have joined us today. And also we are fortunate to have such a great group of SLPS partners. I wanted to remind all attendees that you are in listen only mode to prevent background noises, but you are invited to ask questions throughout the presentation. You can put your questions directly into the WebEx chat box. If you are in a live viewing room or class, you can give your questions to the room host or instructor and they will put them in the chat box. So I'm Benjamin Newton. I'm the Environmental Sustainability Director at Central Community College and the host for today's webinar with Pete Bertelson. I met Pete uh, through our annual pollinator festival at central community college it was held in the fall where he captivated our audiences uh, pete is the partnership director for the bee and butterfly habitat fund and he is currently working with a wide range of partners to support pollinator habitat needs he previously was a regional wildlife biologist with pheasants forever he also worked with state and federal natural resource agencies and the u.s forest service he graduated from texas tech and he has a master's in wildlife science he will be presenting today on pollinators the glue that connects sustainability so welcome pete thanks benjamin uh, i'm really looking forward to today's opportunity to chat with folks about something that uh, is pretty I'm pretty passionate about and think that there's a great story to share. So with that, um, I'll give just a little bit more of an introduction than the one that Benjamin gave. This is a picture of my wife and I as uh, we get ready to burn our native prairie on our land. I'm, I'm talking to you today from central Nebraska. Our farm and ranch is located in the beautiful uh, Lus Hills of central Nebraska. Our farm is uh, located in the part of the world where it's almost evenly divided between uh, row crop production and uh, rangeland. I am an amateur uh, beekeeper. I say amateur because I, I uh, have just a small number of hives and uh, work at that. But really what I am is somebody that has spent my career working to design establish and manage high quality uh, habitat. Whether your interest is in upland game birds or honeybees or grassland songbirds, one of the things that we'll chat about on this webinar today is how they really kind of all fit together with the same type of habitat. So uh, with that, on today's webinar, we have a pretty good representation of a wide range of folks from utility companies to beekeepers, people that are enthusiastic about pollinator habitat, and then state and federal agency. There's agencies. There's certainly uh, other representation on the call, but that's kind of the broad category. And so that's what this webinar was kind of built to address uh, those four categories. <clears throat> so today I'm gonna uh, make the case that I believe that pollinators and their habitat and health needs are a really unique kind of glue that can connect all sorts of issues, particularly the sustainability issues that we'll chat about today. So um, I wanna start out the webinar by making the case that the public is really interested and has a heightened level of understanding about pollinator health. This is just a photo from one of the presentations that has been given recently that kind of shows <clears throat> a fair number of people that came to hear this topic. And I want to make the case for the public's interest that is heightened by showing a couple of things. The first one is a recent survey from the National Recreation and Park Association that found that nine out of 10 Americans want their communities to create pollinator habitat. And that level of a response came, didn't matter what your age or your income, 
or your region or your gender was. And uh, that's hit nine out of 10 Americans to agree on anything today. Uh, kind of shows that that had a really high interest. <clears throat> the next uh, survey I want to tell you about is one that I, I find very, very interesting. Folks at National Geographic surveyed their members and asked this question. You could dedicate your life to saving just one species, which would you choose? And I was surprised by the answer. But when you look at the top five answers, bees came out as number one. And when you kind of think about that in the membership of the National Geographic, and you think about these iconic species like elephants and polar bears and gorillas and all of that kind of stuff. I was surprised that bees came out number one, but I was really surprised to learn that bees received 127% more votes than second place. Pretty interesting to me. And the last survey that I'll show you uh, is a very recent one that came from an effort called the State of the Rockies. <clears throat> and in that survey, where they talked to people in Western states, the issue of pollinators, bee and butterfly health, came out listing very, very high as a serious or extremely serious problem for a very large percentage of the public. And I think those issues are reflected in all kinds of things. If you look at the width and the breadth of corporations in the country, from a very large uh, wholesaler to an international agricultural company to a renewable energy company to, <clears throat> to uh, our educational system. That is a wide range of entities in the public that all have pollinators listed as part of their sustainability plan. And I'll just kind of close out the case for how this is at a heightened level of interest by just kind of talking about the verbiage that you see when you walk into your grocery store. And when you look at some of the terms, the messaging that is now on food, because retailers have come to the conclusion that these sustainability messages are very important for people and are very influential in their buying habits. So that kind of brings us to the point where I wanna make the case that I think we have a very unique moment in time, a unique moment in time when the public has a heightened sense of understanding about the importance of pollinators and the fact that pollinators are in trouble. <clears throat> so let, let's start the conversation out this way. When you call something pollinator habitat, everybody gets some form of a picture in their mind of what they think it looks like. Probably it looks something kind of like this, or it looks like the photo on the calendar in your office when you flip to the month of July, some gorgeous flowering meadow. And that can be that can be what pollinator habitat looks like, but in order to get there, we need to kind of follow some very key specific methods. <clears throat> so there's three platforms that I come to you today kind of representing in the things that I'm going to say. The first is that when we get an acre of habitat, it needs to be the best it can be. We're losing available grasslands and habitat at a pretty substantial rate. So when we get an acre of something that we call pollinator habitat or wildlife habitat, it's really important that we make that acre the best that it can be. The next philosophy that I come to you with is that if we continue to do things the way we've been doing them, we're probably not going to be very successful. We need to look at pollinator habitat and health a little bit differently. And one of the examples that I would give you is the monarch butterfly, where a recent consortium of scientists 
got together and came to the conclusion that if we do nothing different than what we're doing today, we have about a 60% likelihood of extinction of the monarch butterfly in the next 20 years. That's some pretty sobering th stuff. And, and the last platform that I kind of come to you with today is that not all pollinator habitat is equal. Just because something is flowering doesn't necessarily mean that it has real high pollinator value. So these three philosophies kind of go in to the things that we're going to talk about uh, going forward. So why do I say that pollinators are a glue? Well, if you look at this oblong circle that says monarch butterflies and you think of that circle as everything that is important to monarch butterflies and why people care about them, the habitat needs they have, and then you start adding in all kinds of other topics that are important to people. Solar energy, farm policy, endangered species, soil health, all of these different factors that are coming in and you think about all the different things that are important and influence that subject, there's one thing that is common ground for every one of those subjects. And that is that pollinators and the habitat that they need for health and population success can influence every single one of those issues. So that's why I believe that pollinators are a unique glue that can connect all kinds of people. So towards that end, I want to talk about a few really important sustainability issues and how pollinators and pollinator habitat can fit with and mesh with that sustainability issue. And the first one that I want to talk about is solar energy. Solar energy is something that is really expanding uh, right now. <clears throat> Currently, there's about 300,000 acres of ground-mounted solar in the country. And by the year 2030, so basically in the next 10 to 11 years, that is estimated to increase to about 3 million acres of ground-mounted solar. And here's an opportunity to take green energy, solar energy, that people are very excited about and combine it with pollinator habitat and pollinator health. One of the things that I'll talk about late, a little bit later on in this webinar, I'll circle back to solar uh, energy later on in the webinar, but one of the most important things is to think about the vegetative height of our pollinator mixture so that none of the plants in there are growing tall enough to touch the lower edge of that panel. That's a real interesting consideration. And I come to you today representing um, the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund, but also uh, the business of Conservation Blueprint. And Conservation Blueprint spends lots of time working on solar energy projects, uh, currently working with projects in 16 states. And one of the conclusions that I've really come to is how important it is to think about all the factors that you need to think about before you go down the path of designing a seed mixture for a pollinator solar project. Here's what I mean. Here's a couple of key factors that all have to influence how you would design your seed mixture. Where you're located in the country. So you're using species that will do well. What's the budget for that solar project? If we designed a great pollinator mixture that cost $1,000 an acre, it might be a great pollinator mixture, but it might not fit very well with the budget for that project. So that's an important thing to think about. How are we going to plant that seed mixture? How can we make sure that we're planting a seed mixture that has great pollinator value? Because remember, not all pollinator habitat is created equal. Vegetative height restrictions that I just talked about. And then how is that site going to be prepared? Those are six really, really key factors 
there's all kinds of other factors as well, like what pollinator species do you want to benefit? Are you going to mow the solar uh, project in the future? And what impact might that have on your pollinator seed mixture and other things? So just know that for anybody that's listening on the webinar today that is interested in combining solar with pollinator, that you really have to think about all of these things. Stormwater regulation requirements, how quickly will it establish? Will it work in the area? Will it persist if mowing is used on the site in the future? These are all really important factors that have to be added in. And one of the great things is, is that pollinator habitat can check every single one of those boxes that we have with a solar project. It can check every one of these boxes and perform basically at about the same cost as turf type grasses. So we can put the solar company in a position where it can make the decision of whether to establish pollinator value or turf type grasses without having to have the cost be a large determining factor. All right, monarch butterfly benefits. Lots of um, sustainability uh, opportunities related to monarch butterfly benefits. I guess I just wanted to start out by uh, saying that I call the monarch butterflies the most iconically recognized insect in the country. And this is a photo from a mountaintop in south central Mexico where the entire population of the eastern monarch butterfly is overwintering right now as they prepare to head, head north in the next month. And if you're unfamiliar with that story, the monarch butterflies are currently located down where the star is on this, uh, on this image down here. And in the next uh, month, they will begin to work their way north and then go all the way up into Canada throughout the summer. And then four generations later, return all the way back down to that same location in central Mexico. Well, when they're in central Mexico and, and congregating there, uh, we have the opportunity to estimate what their population is. And we can see that the population of monarch butterflies over the last 20 years has decreased significantly. One of the things that you should know is that the national population goal is right here. And last year we were there. We don't yet know what the population estimate for 2019 to 20 uh, will be, but generally that population has been far below the, the range that we want it to be. And we know that by establishing great, highly diverse pollinator habitat, we can increase monarch butterfly populations. I want to chat just for a second about commercial beekeeping, beekeeping and many of the different things that are going on that face and affect that industry. This is a chart that shows for uh, the last 14, 15 years, what the annual losses are of honeybee hives. And this might look like um, lots of bar lines on there and you might not be sure uh, what they really mean. Just know that this line of 15% annual loss is the line at which a beekeeper has to maintain their annual losses to be sustainable. So for quite some time, Beekeepers have been sustaining annual losses that are above that and have made it a extremely challenging industry to be a part of. And when you look at the top five factors that are kind of driving that, there's five really important factors. And when you look at those, we don't really have the opportunity to influence weather. At least I haven't been done very well at that. We're working on it, but we're having a really challenging time being able to control varroa and other diseases. 
And if you're unfamiliar with Varroa, that is a mite uh, that uh, affects honeybees by attaching itself to them. So think about how challenging it would be to control and eliminate an insect that is living on another insect. Very challenging. And then pesticides, and we're always going to have the use of pesticides in agriculture, so that's going to kind of always be a factor as well. That leaves us with habitat, and that is the one thing that I believe that we can influence in many of the ways that we'll be discussing on this webinar today. So it's the one factor out of the top five factors that I think has the most opportunity to be able to work on to positively impact beekeeping sustainability. If bees have access to healthy forage and habitat, they're healthier overall. The next sustainability issue is just to kind of chat about food a little bit. And when you go into a grocery store and we look at and consider all of the foods that we eat in our diet, that require pollination to put on our table. You've probably heard the phrase that one out of every three bites of food that we eat requires a pollinator to put that on our uh, table. And in the US, when you look at the many different crops that are out there that require pollination, there's about 90 of them uh, that happen that uh, we need to have pollination to be able to put that uh, food source on our plate. And perhaps uh, the best story about food sustainability <clears throat> and the importance of pollination is going on right now with the world's largest pollinator event that is occurring out in California with the California almond pollination. That's an 11 billion, with a B, billion dollar industry that is essentially 100% upon honeybee pollination to be able to produce that crop. And the pollination services needed to pollinate almonds in California now basically require almost every hive in the country to be transported to California so that they have enough. Uh, bees to be able to complete their pollination needs. Grassland songbirds. Here, here's a sustainability issue, an issue of concern for people that maybe lots of the folks on this call haven't really heard about or thought of before. But there is perhaps no suite of critters out there that has been kicked in the shins harder than grassland songbirds. Over the last 30 to 40 years, there are 80 to 90% declines in grassland songbird populations. And it really goes back to the same thing that we've chatted about for monarch butterflies, for honeybees. It's a loss of habitat. Whether that habitat is a high quality grassland, a native or restored prairie, or a pollinator habitat planting, they both can provide the habitat needs for grassland songbirds. Chat just a second about precision agriculture and how pollinators can work with the sustainability of agriculture. I wanna start out the story by showing you a picture of my neighbor's cornfield. And this is an irrigated cornfield and when you look at this field and you have the edge of the field in row one and then going all the way out to the later rows here, you can see a significant difference in the height of the crop. And that's due to the competition associated with the edge of the field. Well, when you go in and you look at the ear of corn that came from each row in that field, somewhere between here and here is an opportunity where conservation can increase the income for this farm and ranch because the input costs to grow 
this ear of corn that obviously is uh, not producing an income is the same cost as the cost to produce this ear of corn. So let's look at a real world example. If you're unfamiliar with some of the technology that comes in agriculture right now, agriculture has the ability to look at one square meter of each field. And in this example, this is a, about an 80 acre field of soybeans. The areas of the field that are in green are highly producing, yellow not so much, and the areas that are in red or orange are underproducing. The landowner in this example would be losing money on growing a crop on the areas that are in red. So in this example, this landowner worked with a biology and identified just the areas of red in that field and enrolled them into a conservation program. In this example, uh, a USDA conservation program called CRP. And when we look at what happened in this field, the average yield took a, a slight increase. The profit in the field, the profit per acre, had a significant increase. The return on investment increased significantly. Costs went down and the total profit for the field went up. When an area is selected, I'm gonna back this up. When an area is selected to go into conservation like that, that's the opportunity to strategically think about how can we get multiple benefits. So instead of just planting it to grass, we can plant that and establish it to a habitat that would be very beneficial to uh, pollinators. Water quality is another great example of an issue, a sustainability issue that a lot of people are concerned about. I think generally the further west you go in the country, maybe the more important this issue becomes as populations increase in some areas and water supplies are uh, less abundant. If you think about water quality and the protection of water quality, pollinator habitat can be very well suited to being planted along areas to protect, to protect sediment and nutrients from entering that water system. And if you think about this thing that we call the Gulf of Mexico dead zone, if you're unfamiliar with this, in 2019, the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico was the largest in recorded history, about 8 thousand square miles and the dead zone is produced from nutrients that end up in the Mississippi River that produce a flush of algal growth and the algal growth consumes the oxygen which produces a hypoxia in the Gulf of Mexico a dead zone well the the nutrients that are coming in there into that river are primarily from fertilizer and sewage that enter that drainage system along the way. And just to give you an example, <clears throat> Iowa, the state of Iowa in this picture represents 3.3% of the land area in this image right here, but it has been estimated to produce 55% of the nitrates that enter the Gulf of Mexico. This is not said as an indictment on either Iowa or agriculture. This is brought out as something that is really important that we need to address. And when you take a look at this map that identifies the areas of the country where if we want to have a significant impact on the Eastern monarch butterfly population, we need to focus our effort. Those areas that are in red and in orange those are the same areas that are so influential on what ends up in the Mississippi River and the Gulf of Mexico. This is an opportunity for us to think about how we address the, the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico, how we improve water quality, how we're thinking about monarch butterfly populations, and we can combine all of these different 
really important public issues to a similar goal. This is an example of where I think pollinators are a glue that can influence the uh, dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. <clears throat> Soil health is another really important issue. And when we think about pollinator habitat and soil health, we know that pollinator habitat can go right back into the important issues about carbon storage and water benefits and food and all of those things. So pollinators have the opportunity to really impact soil health as well. Another important issue is looking at right-of-ways and utilities. And if we kind of think about where those are located, they're located throughout the entire country. And when we think about how much of these areas are out there, consider the fact that there are about 9 million acres of power line right-of-ways in the country. And there are about 12 million acres of pipeline right-of-ways like we see here. So here's an opportunity to combine efforts where a pipeline right of way like this that perhaps is mowed on a very frequent basis to keep trees from coming in there could also be established and managed to benefit pollinators. Just one more opportunity where those things have a really easy opportunity to combine. Putting pollinator habitat in can help us keep species off the endangered species list, like the rusty patch bumblebee here. Um, they, the pollinator habitat can benefit all those things. And then it just really has the opportunity to bring together a really wide, diverse group of interests. All right, so I have a final thought for you as we kind of go around the last corner of today's webinar. And that is a unique opportunity that I wanna tell you to support pollinator habitat. And that is with a nonprofit called the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund. This is a pretty young nonprofit that was formed a couple of years ago to get great pollinator habitat onto the landscape and to demonstrate what great habitat looks like. If you're thinking about um, possibly pursuing pollinator habitat going forward, know that the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund provides free pollinator seed mixtures. On projects that are two acres in size or larger, it's open to public, private, and corporate land, which you should interpret as any land. You apply online, and every project receives one-on-one -on -one technical guidance. The Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund establishes pollinator habitat in a really unique way. I know of no other uh, effort that's out there like that. And the way it's done is that half of the project is established to what's referred to as a honeybee mixture, and half of it is established to what's referred to as a monarch butterfly mixture. Here's what they look like. The honeybee mixture, and this happens to be a planting two and a half months after it was planted, is designed using plant species that honeybees very specifically need. And um, lots of pollinator species will use this, but it includes the pollinator species that honeybees need to thrive. The monarch butterfly mixture is designed of a high diversity of local wildflower species, typically about 60 to 70 wildflower species are in a monarch butterfly mixture. And here's an example of how a project can work, just to give you some ideas of the flexibility. Let's just say we have a 20 acre area that an entity wanted to plant the pollinator habitat, whether it's a landowner or a city that has a grassy area around their wastewater treatment plant that they mow every week and they want to convert it to habitat. In this example, we would take this 20 acre field, and we would plant 10 acres of the honeybee mix on half of it, and 10 acres of the monarch butterfly mix on the other half. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward, but there's lots of other creative ways 
that we could look at planting this field. Same 20 acre field. And in this example, we planted the honeybee mix around the outside of the project and the monarch butterfly mix in the center of the project. The reason that we could do this is so that the honeybee mix can serve as a green fire break so that in the future, when that landowner wants to perform a prescribed burn, they can do a prescribed burn on the monarch butterfly mix and the honeybee mix serves as a green fire break. Pretty innovative and shows a lot of the flexibility. The last example out there is where you can, they don't have to be contiguous projects. Maybe you have 10 acres on one side of the property uh, and 10 acres on the other. They can be done that way as well. I want to circle back to talking about solar power. This is the opportunity to get pollinator habitat on the ground that is just expanding and taking off. Here's an example of an 80 megawatt project that decided that it wanted to have pollinator benefits in there. And this area right here, these little lines in there, this is the blueprint. These are the solar panels that are in there. Well, remember, with the solar panels, we have vegetative height restrictions. We do not want plants that will touch the lower panel height. So that's where the honeybee mixture from the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund is designed so that it can be planted underneath the panels within the solar array, provide great pollinator habitat, establish quickly, meet stormwater regulation requirements, be cost effective, and meet that vegetative height restriction. And around the outside of the project, not under the array, is where the monarch butterfly mix is planted, where we don't have vegetative height restrictions. For this project, we went one step further and actually included an apiary on part of the project. And that really opened the door for some very unique opportunities to talk about solar and pollinator benefits and a great sustainability message. Plan B Brewery received, uh, they, they have a solar project that went in, the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund provided the seed, the pollinator seed mixture. Plan B Brewery used honey from the solar project and put it into the products, the beer that they produced to produce a solar honey. What a great sustainability message in combining one, two, three, and more different sustainability issues and messages, and what a great message for the public to get excited about. So remember, we really want to think about the height of that lower panel and how tall our vegetation is, and that's where the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund is working uh, very specifically to provide those kinds of uh, benefits. Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund is documenting the pollinator benefits from their seed mixtures in four different studies. I'm gonna conclude the webinar by just kind of talking about what one of the early study results has shown from the US Geological Survey. And when they compared Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund seed mixtures to USDA conservation programs, national wildlife refuges, roadsides, grasslands, pastures, all the available habitat that was out there on the landscape, they found that the In Butterfly Habitat Fund seed mixtures had more flowers than any of the other landscape types, was more beneficial for honeybees, and significantly, eight times more beneficial for native bee species. Those are some of the early results that are really showing the value of designing seed mixtures based on some of the foundations that we started the project talking about. And here's what can happen. Here's a, a set of landowners 14 months after they planted this project standing in their monarch butterfly uh, seed mixture. That's the kind of habitat that we can get 
And we can design pollinator habitat to think about all kinds of issues, from agriculture to grassland songbirds, monarch butterflies, corporate sustainability, and great pollinator habitat can touch every one of those issues. Pollinators and their habitat are the glue that can uh, connect all of those issues. I close by uh, telling you that uh, one of the things I'd like to have you look into is every month, Conservation Blueprint puts out a brand new video pollinator habitat tip, about a two to four minute habitat tip on a wide range, wide range of topics. You can uh, sign up for that uh, by going to the Conservation Blueprint website, going to the uh, Facebook page, any of those issues. You can follow the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund and Conservation Blueprint on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We hope that you do. And I will turn it over back uh, to Benjamin now for questions. But here's the contact information. If your question doesn't get covered today, or you have additional questions after this that you'd like to uh, pass along, I'd be happy to try and answer them. So Benjamin, back to you. All right, thank you, Pete. Very informative visual presentation uh, on the diverse connections between pollinators and sustainability. We do have quite a few questions, so I'm hoping we can get through all of them before uh, one o'clock here. Um, but I'll go ahead and get started with the first question. Um, it's, uh, I recently read that bird seeds are being 